and welcome to another episode of the Red Delta Project Podcast, where we teach you how to get in the best shape of your life without gym memberships or stressful and restrictive dieting. My name is Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project and author of the books Fitness, Independence, and Smart Bodyweight Training. This week's topic, we're looking at myths and misconceptions of the book Convict Conditioning. This book came out a little over 10 years ago, and it was a major influence in the progressive calisthenics revolution because these days it's very popular and people say oh i train with body weight training and people are like yeah sure that makes sense but back then it was this really kind of crazy idea nobody thought that body weight training could be a truly serious discipline when it came to conditioning the body so over the years <clears throat> a lot of ideas and myths come about and plus there's a lot of questions i get regarding what Paul Wade talks about in his book. So I figure, why not collect it all into one podcast here and I'll give you my opinions. Of course, naturally, I'm not Paul Wade, but I've read everything that I can get my hands on and I think I've got a pretty good bead on what Paul Wade's talking about, but I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section down below or at reddeltaproject at gmail.com. So first couple things to address are two of the ideas that float around, especially on the internet, that can undermine the credibility of convict conditioning. And this happens from a cynical standpoint. And just a little side note, my perspective on a lot of cynicism out there is that it doesn't actually do you any good. Being cynical about a person or a program or something essentially turns off any sort of attention towards and says, nah, this can't be true, I don't believe it, and you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The first uh, cynical part of it is, is Paul Wade real and is his story real? Well, to be honest with you, I don't think it really matters very much. There's a lot of theories out there on who Paul Wade is, but he likes to keep his anonymity. He likes to not be known. So there's a lot of theories out there that it's all a marketing ploy, that convict conditioning was written by the Cavadlos and stuff. Paul Wade's made up. In the end, I don't think it matters. But it does matter if we look at it with a cynical eye, because anything that can create a sense of doubt about a program can undermine your progression and results, because so much of your ability to get results depends on the faith you have in both yourself and in the methods you're using to get the results you want. Doubt will always undermine your ability to get the results. So if you doubt the story, if you doubt the program or you doubt yourself, doesn't matter how hard you work or how great the program is. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to buy the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. I'm just saying, don't really care so much about it. Paul Wade could be real. It could be a bunch of monkeys in a room with typewriters, for all we know. It doesn't really matter. I encourage you to not really put too much weight into it. Now, the second cynical idea that floats around out there is that convict conditioning isn't really a prison style approach that came up in the penitentiary system because you hear people like in who are incarcerated people online who worked in prison saying i was a guard and stuff nobody in prison is doing this stuff but again this makes a lot of sense because convict conditioning is a particular recipe of progressive body weight training that paul wade himself has collated and created over years of research and experimentation so of course you're not going to run into this type of training unless you worked or were in the same area as Paul Wade himself or his students. So it's a recipe. It's kind of like saying we've got stuffed crust pizza here in the United States. Then you go to Italy and talk about stuffed crust pizza and everybody's like, no way. Stuffed crust pizza doesn't exist. We've been in pizza shops all over Italy. No one has stuffed crust pizza. You've got to be telling a myth. So it's the recipe that is part of convict conditioning. But in the book, Paul Waite doesn't say that everybody in prison is doing convict conditioning. He's saying body weight training as a tool is in prisons. And this is understandable due to the lack of resources that many convicts may face while incarcerated. So those are the first two things we want to address. Now, the next is kind of a bunch of ideas that Paul Wade talks about in his book that I get questions on a lot regarding how hard you should be approaching the training. The first one is, do you really have to start on step one, no matter what your fitness level is? Do you really need to do it only once a week? Do you need such low volume, like a couple of hard work sets? And do you really not need to go to failure? These ideas are highly recommended by Paul Wade in his work saying, don't really push yourself as hard as you think you can or scale back. So I get a lot of emails from people saying, is it really like, do I really scale back that much? Here's the context with these recommendations. 
Paul Wade doesn't know who you are. He doesn't really know what you need, where your strengths or your weaknesses are regarding your athleticism or your training experience. Also keep in mind that when convict conditioning came out, a lot of people hadn't really done any serious bodyweight training to any degree at that point within our fitness culture. So as a coach, especially as someone writing a book who doesn't know you, it's safe and it makes a lot more sense to say, hold back a little bit. Start at the beginning, don't push yourself too hard, low volume, don't go to failure and all these sorts of things as a means of saying, build up slowly. Start at the ground level and build yourself up. Should you be pushing yourself more if you really think it's warranted? Absolutely, for sure. Keep in mind that body weight training and weightlifting are very much the same thing. They have the same ideas, the same principles. They make the body bigger and stronger for the same exact reasons with the one exception, which is that while weightlifting keeps your technique roughly the same and you adjust the weight that you lift, like on a barbell or dumbbell, with body weight training, your weight, i.e. you, stays the same, but you adjust the technique. And when you have a technical approach to progression, there's a lot of ingredients in that recipe. There's mobility, there's stability, there's joint strength, there's coordination, there's a whole bunch of things. And anybody coming to any sort of training, but especially body weight training, for the first time may have weaknesses or little uh, discrepancies in any of these areas that can certainly hold you back or set you up for injury. So going too fast, too far, too quickly and too aggressively can often expose these injuries lots of times to your detriment. Regarding failure, my personal opinion is I always tell people just go, just push yourself because going and grinding yourself to a very high level of fatigue and even potentially to muscle failure is something mostly experienced lifters can do. Nine times out of 10 for most people, it's the mind that gives up before the muscle. So that's why I tell people, just go, push yourself to as much as you can, making sure that your form is dialed in as much as possible. Another question that comes up a lot is people are saying, when do I advance to the next step or to the next progression in the system? And this is a little bit of a backwards type of thinking to it. You want to have the opposite approach of instead of saying, when can I progress to the next level? It's more like, how long can I stay at a given level and still get something from it? Can still squeeze it. I like to think of it like squeezing water from a sponge. So when we have the attitude of when can I get to the next level? When can I progress to the next step as quickly as possible? That's like taking a sponge and saying, I want to get as much water out of it. You give it a couple of light squeezes and then you're like, okay, I'm done. What's the next sponge? Instead, you want to really bring out your step. It's really scrunch and crush and get every little bit that you possibly can out of every step. So that way you're building up as strong a foundation as possible. Now, earlier I said that bodyweight training and weightlifting are very much the same thing. Wait, bodyweight training is weightlifting. It's just you're the weight. So in light of that, we need to put these 10 steps into a dip, bit of a different perspective than I think a lot of people interpret it in convict conditioning. Because think of each of these steps as just different levels of resistance. Now in the weightlifting world, if you said I bench press 135 and said, that would be like saying I do step five of the push-up series. Okay, makes sense. But when we approach it with body weight training and we say I do level five of push-ups, and that's the only level I ever work on, that's again like that weightlifter saying, I bench press 135 and I never use any other weight. I don't warm up with anything lighter, I don't do drop sets, I don't go heavier when I'm feeling good, I only bench press 135, which in my experience, back when I was lifting, is a really good way to stay at a plateau. So we want to approach these 10 steps kind of like just any other form of adjustable resistance. In weightlifting, there's reasons to use lighter weight, there's reasons to use heavier weight, depending on a million different programming personal variables from day to day. Use the same exact approach with progressive calisthenics. Sometimes you'll use the lighter steps for warming up, to rehab, prehab, work on technical proficiency. Maybe you're having an off day, you wanna go higher rep, you want to do more of a cardio circuit training. There's a lot of reasons to go lighter. At the same time, there's reasons to go a little bit harder and heavier. Maybe you're doing something of a more powerlifting style, or you're trying to really work on something with shorter repetitions, a program like a five by five. You're not going to use the same step that you would do reps for like 10 to 12. 
So adjust the resistance exactly as you would with a weightlifting approach, where sometimes you go heavier, sometimes you go lighter, but it's something that you can move around with mobility as opposed to staying stuck at one point. And the last points that I wanted to address today are regarding how we have an attitude towards that coveted 10th master step. A lot of times there's two different attitudes that I get with 10th master steps, where some people will look at the high level stuff like one arm pull-ups and say, is it even possible? Is it even something that's attainable? And then on the other end of the spectrum, some people have almost an entitlement mentality from it, saying like, well, how long does it take me to get there? Like it's a sure thing to be able to do one arm push-ups. Like it's guaranteed to happen and guaranteed to happen quickly. I basically think of this as more of a symptom of that whole everybody gets a trophy kind of attitude that I grew up with, uh, the participation trophies and stuff. Like everybody deserves to be a winner. But first let's tackle the one of, is it possible? Well, yes, of course it's possible. If you look hard enough on like YouTube and stuff, you will find videos of people doing one-arm handstand push-ups, one-arm push-ups, pistol squats galore. So stuff like that is certainly possible. But are you guaranteed to get it? Is it something that can definitely happen? Well, here's, here's my perspective with this, is we keep thinking that fitness is a fair deal that everything should be fair, that everybody should be able to get big and jacked and lean and sexy and be the champion football star in high school, right? But the reality is fitness isn't fair. Fairness is an artificial construct we invented as human beings. We think that everything should be fair and equal and stuff. And this certainly has good moral implications with things like human rights and stuff. And that's certainly applicable. I'm not saying that things shouldn't be fair when it comes to law and order. But when it comes to the workings of mother nature, which fitness is a natural process, mother nature has no concept of fairness because it's an artificial construct. Instead, mother nature is all about balance, which is why in an ecosystem, not every animal can be an apex predator. You've got sharks and you've got minnows. But if you everything was, ba was equal, then it'd be all sharks and nothing could survive. But the sharks and the minnows balance each other out for a balanced ecosystem. And in fitness, that's what's actually going on, is we have a balanced state, not a fair state, which means some people are gonna be doing pistol squats after a few weeks of training. Some people are gonna do squats for months, hell, maybe even a few years, and still not be able to do pistol squats. Is that fair? No, but it is balanced because your ability to get results is about the balance between what's in your mind what's in your heart, and what your body is physically capable of doing. And we all come to the table with a different set of circumstances. So the timeline of reaching that 10th step is different for everybody. Some people are gonna be there faster, some people are gonna take years, some people may never even get there at all. But don't let that discourage you, because remember that progressive calisthenics, like strength training, is a skill. And as these 10 steps represent, these are just simply mile markers. They're not a definitive start and end point in your training. Instead, with a progressive skill, there's no end point. That 10th step, that's like black belt in martial arts. It seems like the top of the mountain, but any black belt will tell you that's when it's just like, that's when their training really began. I got to be black belt when I was 16. And at the time I thought, hey man, I'm hot shit, I know what I'm doing. And now I look back, I'm like, you didn't know jack squat, Matt. You've got so much more to grow. And that's the same attitude you wanna have with that 10 step. Yes, it's a high goal to reach for, but no, it's by no means the pinnacle of achievement and athleticism. There's plenty of more progress beyond that. At the same time, don't feel like you have to get to that 10 step to get results because everybody can get progress. Everybody can feel better and look better and perform better. And you don't need to get to the 10th step even quickly in order to make that happen. You simply need to be a little tiny bit better than you are right now to start seeing results. So there you go. I hope that clears up some confusion and some ideas around convict conditioning. Left a link down below if you wanted to check that book out. It's been out for quite a while. Still highly rated from what I understand. Love to hear your thoughts down below in the comments section at the RDP community or Gmail, uh, reddeltaproject at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you guys next week. Till then, be fit, live free.